morning, Holy Spirit Lutheran Church family. We all hope you had a very healthy and happy Thanksgiving. Our Advent season will be a busy one, so here are all of the upcoming events. This year's Angel Tree will be donned with gift tags and available on the church patio today and Sunday, December 6th. The angel tree tags will include a child's age, sex, clothing size, and their gift wish. Unwrapped gifts should be returned by December 13th and cost no more than $30. This will ensure that each child receives an equitable gift. To facilitate gift tracking, please either place the gift tag in the bag or attach it to the gift. If you have not been attending church and want to participate, you can stop by the church office or contact Cindy Ryan, and she will get an angel gift tag to you. Her email is cindyryan at comcast.net. Text or call her at 561-371-2253. This year, due to COVID, Breakfast with Santa will be transformed. Want to see Santa and Mrs. Claus safely? Join us on Saturday, December 5th or Friday, December 11th between 5 to 7 p.m. Physical distancing will be practiced and masks are required and will only be removed for the photo. Please pre-register your family for a 10-minute time slot to take your picture with Santa and Mrs. Claus. Arrive a few minutes early to shop on the patio, buy a holiday candle from his kids, and some Christmas cookies, cakes, and more from Soulfire. After your visit with Santa, explore the honor garden decorated in Christmas wonder. To register, please email me at the email below. On Sunday, December 13th, we will hold the Holy Spirit Lutheran Church annual meeting in the church sanctuary and via Zoom. This meeting will begin at 12.30 p.m. Registration is required for indoor seating, but not necessary if you are joining us online. We will be emailing the Zoom link as we get closer to the 13th. On Saturday, December 19th, starting at 5 p.m., we would like to invite you to a very merry, jazzy Christmas on our church patio and honor garden. Bring your own adult beverages while listening to light instrumental Christmas jazz from members of Doctrine. Podunk Eats, a delicious local food truck, will also be on campus and available if you're hungry. It's going to be a great night of fun and fellowship. Please contact me to register for this event. We are so excited for our Christmas services this year at Holy Spirit. This year's Christmas Eve Eve peer service is going virtual. Join us online on December 23rd at 6 p.m. wherever you are to experience this beautiful evening of worship. You'll be able to watch this service on our church website or on Facebook. Did you get all that? It's a busy season. So, Connor, how did we do with the Thanksgiving food drive? Hello, HSLC family. Uh, I wanted to take a moment here to report the final tally of our Thanksgiving food drive we've been working on so hard this month. Uh, and just to say, you guys really blew it out of the water here. Uh, the total weight that was collected was 4,622 pounds, over 1,100 more than our initial goal of 3,500 pounds, which is amazing. But not only that, we also collected $2,161 that went into an account that we can give to the food bank to help feed these families in Lake Park. A big chunk of that money went to purchase Publix gift cards, which will be placed into the food bags that are given to the families so they can buy their turkeys. Um, it was an amazing time of youth and families and parents working together to make this happen. Just wanted to shout out everybody who came and helped out. It was an amazing time. And if you want to see a full recap, be sure to watch the Thanksgiving moment where we'll have footage from the event. Again, thank you very much, Holy Spirit Lutheran Church. You do not disappoint. The first Sunday in Advent, the Prophecy Candle. The Advent wreath is made up of five candles. The candles symbolize the light of God entering the world through the birth of Jesus Christ. The four colored candles on the outside represent the four weeks of waiting prior to the birth of Jesus. The white candle in the middle is the Christ candle, and it reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. 
The first Advent candle is called the Prophecy Candle. It represents all of the prophecies of the Old Testament that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, fulfilled. The Old Testament contains hundreds of prophecies that predict the birth, life, and death of Christ. For example, from Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The first Advent candle reminds us that God kept his promise to send us a Savior. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for this season of Advent that helps us prepare for the coming of Christ at Christmas. As we read the Bible and light a candle, may excitement for Christ's coming burn in our hearts. Amen. Please join with me for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. The Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Last Sunday was the conclusion of the November Thanksgiving Food Drive for 2020, and despite the challenges, we've surpassed our goal. With our target set at 3,500 pounds, we began at the start of November directing all food donations toward the food drive. With over 2,500 pounds coming in during the last week, we met a final weight of 4,622 pounds. Not only did we demolish our goal weight, we also brought in $2,161 to go toward the food drive and Lake Park Food Bank. Some of this money was used to purchase Publix gift cards, which will be sent out with each bag given to the families to allow them to buy a turkey for their own Thanksgiving. The 
The rest will be sent to the food bank to allow them to continue to serve the people of Lake Park. Tuesday morning, the food was distributed to those who came to the food bank in need. Each family was given a bag from our food drive, a box of vegetables, and either a gift card or a turkey. The food bank was able to supply 308 families with food to last them for the next couple of weeks. HSLC and Soulfire brought together 40 volunteers to sort and bag the food on Sunday, and on Tuesday morning, 44 volunteers, including eight sheriff's deputies, worked to distribute the food. Holy Spirit Lutheran Church, thank you so much for your support, which has helped to make all of this possible. Over 300 families will have food this holiday due to your combined efforts with the Palm Beach County Food Bank, the Bethlehem Baptist Church of Lake Park, the Nativity Lutheran Church, and many others. To quote Pastor Jim, the kingdom expanded just a little bit further into our broken world through this ministry. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the volunteers and ministry partners. Mark chapter 3, verses 32 through 37. But about that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves his home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake. You do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening, or at midnight, 
or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you is what I say to all. Keep awake. Here ends the reading. So let me begin by wishing you a happy new year. That may seem odd, I know. I am aware that it is still November. Hopefully you remember from last week that today, the first Sunday in Advent, begins the new church year calendar. We celebrated last week Jesus' kingship. We celebrated that we know how the story of Jesus and our stories end. Today, that all resets as our minds turn toward Christmas approaching the arrival of our promised King. And the Sundays leading up to Christmas are supposed to help us think about preparing for our King's arrival, waiting and watching, as today's text tells us. Advent begins thinking about the return and re-arrival of our King. As we move through the four weeks of Advent, the focus shifts toward retelling the story of our King's first arrival, all done with a sense of waiting and expectancy. A man calls his mother, Mom, how are you? Not too good, says the mother. I've been very weak. And the son says, why are you so weak? She says, because I haven't eaten in 38 days. The son says, that's terrible. Why haven't you eaten in 38 days? The mother answers, because I didn't want my mouth to be filled with food if you should call. Ouch. Our culture doesn't look favorably upon waiting, does it? Any kind of waiting is too long. Whether it's a mother waiting for her adult children to call for a visit, or it's one of us standing in line at Starbucks, we do not celebrate waiting. And what waiting looks like has changed for us. Inevitably, waiting rooms and checkout lines used to be opportunities to strike up conversations with our neighbors. They are now screen time, isolating dives into our smartphones. We make the waiting tolerable by escaping the act of waiting. But this morning in Mark's gospel, Jesus tells us we are going to have to be okay with waiting. None of us knows when the king is coming. Sure, we know about Christmas Day and when it happened, but Jesus' return? None of us knows, not even Jesus. So we're going to be waiting. And while we wait, it'd probably be a good idea to get our heads out of our phones, get our heads up out of the mindset of just passing the time. Instead, keep awake, says Jesus. Stay alert. Don't escape, but rather be present in the waiting. A detail caught my eye studying the text this time that I hadn't paid attention to before. There seems to be a specific charge made to the doorkeeper separate from the other servants. The doorkeeper is charged with being vigilant, with keeping the watch and staying awake. So I did a little digging to see if there is any other scriptural references to doorkeepers. In fact, some commentators refer to this as the parable of the doorkeeper. The Old Testament mentions this doorkeeper role a few times. They seem to have a function of protecting admittance to the inner courtyards, either of a home or of a temple or the king's estate. The psalmist uses this image in talking about God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. But the most familiar scriptural reference to me was what Jesus says in John's gospel. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And I found that to be very interesting. I'll tell you why in a minute. I want to give you a thing you should know about how I understand scripture. 
If the reading before us today is a parable about the doorkeeper, you should know the two things I think are fundamental about parables. First, one of my college religion professors called parables a kick in the head. His theory was that parables double us over because their intention was to disrupt the way we think about God and or the kingdom of God. Parables surprise us, shock us, or at least give us pause to hear something about God in a new way. Parables are disruptions to our comfortable boxes we try to put God in. The second thing I believe about parables are that they're first about God or the kingdom of God or Jesus. And only after that are they about how we fit within the announcement about God. For instance, the parable of the Good Samaritan is not first and foremost a morality teaching that you should help people in need. Maybe that is one takeaway from it, but it's not the thing you are supposed to take away from it. It is first a story about Jesus who comes to us in the least expected form we can imagine. Maybe even a despised form like those awful Samaritans and rescues us. An outsider who saves the day. We can talk about that more someday. So if this parable of the doorkeeper is going to surprise us, and if it's first saying something about the kingdom of God, how do we make sense of it? Let me offer a couple of things for you to chew on the rest of the day. Note that in John's gospel, Jesus does not identify himself as the doorkeeper or the gatekeeper. If you read on, he will call himself both the gate and the good shepherd, but Jesus does not call himself the gatekeeper or doorkeeper. It seems to be a position we are charged with, a charge made more clearly in the parable we started with today from Mark. And we are urged to be faithful in this charge, to stay awake, to be ready. So if we lay the Mark reading alongside of the John reading, I think it's reasonable to say that we open the door for our shepherd, Jesus. We are the ones who open the door for Jesus and to Jesus. Many of you know this painting. One of the subtleties of this painting I like is that there's no door handle on the outside, which is to say that Jesus is waiting. You see what I did there? Jesus is waiting. Is that perhaps the kick in the head? What's that then mean? Is that passive? Do we like images of a passive Jesus? We like to talk about our dependence on Jesus or on God, how we rely on him. What's it mean if that gets flipped on us and instead Jesus is waiting on us? Jesus is relying on us to open the door? Hold on to that thought for a minute. Something else to consider. Jesus tells us in today's reading, but about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Whereas I hear his instruction to keep awake with some urgency, I don't hear it desperately or anxiously. Jesus wants us to be ready for the end times, but I don't think he wants us intimidated by end times. Evangelical theologian, now turned Episcopalian, Diana Butler Bass writes, part of the problem with end times theology is that Western people see time as a line. We think in terms of beginning, middle, and end. Thus, to consider the end times, is to anticipate the end of the world as we know it, when history will cease to be. But the biblical texts of Advent point in another more mysterious direction, that time is not a line. Rather, time is held in the being of God. Indeed, time is timeless. Think about it for just a moment. What do the divisions past, present, and future really mean? When does the present slip into the past? When does the future arrive? When is the now of the present? 
Isn't time much more of a wonder, a spiritual or philosophical question than a line? If we enter the Advent journey with a different perspective on time, the apocalyptic texts speak afresh. This is the dance of time, grace-filled steps that enact God's vision that the end times are all about, that all times are the end times. In this spirit of times enfolded in time, we walk through Advent. Jesus has been born, but we act as if we're still waiting. Christ will return, yet Christ has already come. If that was too much of a head trip for you, I came across a quote from Wilbur Wright I had not seen before. He was the elder brother of the Wright brothers, the fathers of modern aviation. Their first flight happened December 17th, 1903. Wilbur Wright wrote, I confess that in 1901, I had said to my brother Orville that man would not fly for 50 years. Ever since, I have distrusted myself and avoided all predictions. He was only 48 years off. All of this is to say that I don't think we humans do so well with predictions, managing time, or waiting in time for that matter. We are crummy with time. I think Jesus was wise to not tell us when his return would be because that wasn't his focus. I think his focus was on being ready, staying awake, being prepared not just at the last minute, but rather living each day, each minute, prepared and awake. I think we misinterpret our doorkeeper gatekeeper function if we think it's about protecting the Christian community from the evils of the world because too often we think that means having to protect Jesus and defend Christianity. Back to that John passage, Jesus says he is not the gatekeeper, but rather the gate. The gate is the defense. Jesus is the defense. That's not what he needs us to do. He is not counting on us for that role. Jesus has got that role covered. This is how I'm hearing Jesus this morning in the parable of the doorkeeper. The image I get is one where we are charged with having one foot in and one foot out. We are included with the other servants, the ones working for the master. We have a foot in that identity, but our role also has a foot outside the door or the gate. We stand in the gap, if you will. We stand between those inside and outside. We stand between those already in and those not yet in. We are doormen and doorwomen at the ready to introduce those not yet inside the kingdom to what life in the kingdom is like. I hear today's reading as a call to be inviters, inviting others into a life with Christ. Our job isn't defense, it's invitation. We open the door for those who can't find the door handle to get in. Pseudo-Catholic theologian Margaret Silf writes, God comes to us not where we should have been if we had made all the right choices in life, not where we could have been if we had taken every opportunity that God's offered us, not where we wish we were if we didn't have to be in the place where we find ourselves, not where we think we are because our minds are out of sync with our hearts, not where other people think we are or think we ought to be when they are attending to their own agendas. God meets us where we really are. If that's true, that God meets us where we really are, then that means any moment is a moment you or I could be the introduction to Jesus someone may or may not have known they needed. We could be the doorkeeper opening the gate to a whole new way of living, a life lived with kingdom values and a life lived with the master. There could be one more servant working inside the house when the master returns, when the shepherd returns to lead us all out. 
Let me leave you with another twist, another kick in the head. If Jesus is on the other side of the door, the side without the handle, waiting, if Jesus has chosen again to identify with those on the outside, like that good Samaritan, what if part of this parable is to say the same thing that the parable says of the sheep and the goats at the final judgment? This is what I mean. In that parable of the sheep gathered at the right hand and the goats gathered at the left hand of the judge, both groups are surprised by the results because when they visited the prisoner or fed the hungry person or clothed the naked person, they didn't know they were visiting and feeding and clothing Jesus. When they chose not to visit the prisoner or not to feed the hungry person or not to clothe the naked person, they didn't know they were not visiting or not feeding or not clothing Jesus. In that parable, Jesus too was disguised among the outsiders, the less than, the forgotten. What if the urgent instruction of the parable of the doorkeeper is to be ready to let in the same disguised Jesus, the same master returning in disguise? What if we are to be ready at any moment and all moments to bring someone inside only to discover that person has Jesus's face, has Jesus's voice? And in that moment, we recognize the master shepherd has come home. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back or what he will look like. Be ready to open the doors. Amen. I invite you to join with me now as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me as we gather our hearts and minds in prayer. Gracious God, we know you are the beginning and the end of all time. You are the author of life. Remind us again and again that all we know is in your keeping. Remind us again and again that we need not fear our next day or our last day. Freed from worry and anxiety, teach us to make the most of each day from you inviting others to do the same with us. Make us courageous and bold in our witness to live lives in you. Meet us where we are and show us how to meet others where they are. All the while, give us patience and waiting for you to move. This week we are grateful during a year when so much has been turned on its head, when so much has been lost, when so much has been grieved, we still are compelled to give you our thanks, not as we should, but as we are able. Look after our families from whom we are separated. Bring us to happy reunions soon. Watch over those persons who suffer, are ill, or are in need of prayer, whom we name silently before you now. Mend their wounds, comfort their grief, Bring words of gratitude to their lips. We pray for our communities, for this nation made up of so many varied communities. Help us not think generally of our life together, where villainizing comes far too easily. Help us think of our neighbor, those whom we volunteer with, 
those whom we share sidewalks and streets with, those whom we know by name. Knit us ever closer together when so much attempts to tear us apart. Show us our common ground. Draw out the best in each of us. All these things we ask in your holy name. Come, Lord Jesus, again. Make our hearts ready to receive you again. In your most holy name, we pray the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. God Almighty, send you light and truth to keep you all the days of your life. The hand of God protect you. The holy angels accompany you. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.